This program was made possible by a grant from the Kirkpatrick Foundation. Creativity. Creativity. Gang related shootings and killings seem to be at the top of the trend. Until about the, the mid 80s, no one in Oklahoma City ever thought much about the gang issue because it was either an East Coast or a West Coast problem. And so we saw, you know, through the mid 80s into the 90s, uh, gang involvement increasing, and that trend has continued. It's to the point now we have to do something or it's, it's going to continue to progress and it's going to be worse. We're going to have down here what they have in Los Angeles right now, and we don't want that down here. Give back to the community that we took Reaching from. Reaching out to the kids. We have to build up. We can up. use the, the same people that used to be out here terrorizing our communities. We can use the same people to mentor our children. This is the most creative solution I would have ever thought of for the gang violence problem. Teaching the same. The gang culture has spread to human homicides in Tulsa and a weekend killing here in Oklahoma City. Creativity. 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 This is who we are. This is who, this we, is are. who we are. Creativity is about solutions. It's about answers. Creativity more is more than the arts. Yes. More than a process. Creativity is about action. It's about action. Creativity, Creativity is about action. Creativity is about action. Creativity is the state of mind. Oklahoma is the state of creativity. When you're out here in the streets, can't nobody tell you nothing. There was a certain image that I wanted to portray to people. You know, I wanted to be this big, bad dude. Seems like nobody can mess with you. Your homeboys got your back and you got theirs. The streets was rough, and some days was harder than others. Nobody can tell me what to do. Nobody's going to tell me what to do because nobody's going to hurt me. So I chose the gang. Gangbanging is inbred in American culture now. In our society, gangbanging is a reality in every state in the nation, and it's migrated all across this country. If you look at all across our particular state, not only in Oklahoma City and Tulsa, which are two largest metropolitan areas, uh, we have gang sets in little small towns. Gang-related shootings. Uh, hey, look the forward. gang culture has spread to the smallest community. Yeah, neighborhood 90s. Yeah, neighborhood If I can be frank, uh, it's a living it's hell. A living hell. This is gang. I've seen so many people shot. I was shot with the shotgun. We got into a gang fight. The guy walks up to the car and stick a 9mm in the window on me. Oh, you want to play with guns? I got a gun right here. I ended up getting hit in the face and the chest with some bug shots with the shotgun. I've seen people die in my arms. I've seen people shot in the head and make it. You know, I'll go in my boot and click it back, and, and that's that. Everything stems back to the drugs and alcohol. It was a way to support the habit that I had. Uh, and then it quickly became a way of life. Every day you gotta wake up and, and not knowing whether there's gonna be gunfire, gunplay, or uh, fighting, and it's just, it's, it's a survival mode, it's a jungle. I don't think unless you've grown up in those neighborhoods, you can ever understand that culture. You just can't, you just can't understand why a six or seven or eight year old child would think, you know, wow, that's what I want to be, a gangbanger. But that's what it is. And many times, they're seeking inclusion. They're seeking some sense of belonging. belonging. You know, my father really wasn't around. I didn't really meet him again until I was 12. I was very young, about 14. 12. I was 13, 14. 17. I was 13 years old. I turned to the kids that I went, that I hung around the neighborhoods with and went to school with. It's like, a family that you find that you feel that 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 gives you that that comfort, you know, that love. You know, they show you that love. It seems like you, nobody can mess with you. You know, not even your dad, the one that was beating on you before. The protection there when once you join the gang, you know, your 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 homeboys got your back and and you got theirs. The streets was rough. It's you like know, the alpha male in the jungle. Nobody can mess All with you. All my aggressions and my anger it played into the gang. I have been in the gang since I was 15 years old. I got raped, actually, by a gang member. 
that was from a, a total different game than I was from. I'm the oldest of five girls and I have no brothers. So during the rape, I got pregnant and my mom didn't believe in abortion. So we went on ahead and I had the baby. But because of that and I had no protection, I chose a gang. I had no father in my life. It was an all-girl family, and I had to do what I had to do so I know that next time I would be protected. So that's why I joined the gang. When I was in the gang, to me, being as young as I was, it was excellent. You got the cars, you got the money, you know, you, you have the dope, and you got the recognition that the, you're a legend. Nobody, everyone knows not to mess with bow legs male or female, because they know that she will get her revenge on you. Oh, you want to play with guns? I got a gun right here. You know, I'll go in my boot and click it back, and, and that's that. I was addicted to being in the game because I wanted to be known, I wanted to be recognized, and I wanted to be appreciated for who I was. And not only did I feel like you needed to know that, but I felt like I needed to know that because of all the hurt and pain that I was covering up, that's how I released it, and that's how I lashed back at the world, because the world wasn't helping me. It is the wrong mentality to have, because you feel like nothing in the world can take you. That's your high. You feel like you're fierce, and there's no one above you, not even God. That's how you feel when you're in the game. No one or nothing can take you. Actually became more dangerous. Respect person. is more than money. Respect is more than, I mean, respect is more than respect itself. Because if, if you don't have respect, you know, you have nothing. It's exciting to have a pistol in your possession. First. I was dominant. The streets raise you, you're taught that respect is there. If, you let, if I let you disrespect me and they watching, they're going to do it too, so I got to stop it right there. And that's really where it all comes from. You know, I mean, respect is a a big, big, big key of the gang world, you know, and that's something that you have to have. It's all about respect. That's all it really is, respect. I demand my respect. I, all I want is revenge. It's, it's serious when it comes to gang bang. It's killing and dying. If you don't have respect, respect. You know, it was a shotgun and they started you shooting. Know, you have nothing. Yeah, it's, it's a mentality. It's, it, it really is. Gangs are not the problem. It's just the way they think. If I don't like you, probably because you represent a neighborhood that wear blue, I wear something, I wear a color that represents another neighborhood, then if I don't like what you stand for, I, I take you out. I just kill you. He opened fire. As long as he and, got on know, that I turned color, around, I, I was the like only him. dude still there. He is my enemy, and I will it's, kill it's him. It's basically being the top of it. A whole bunch of guys running across the street. By that time, when I was 21, I was already known as a leader, one of the big leaders from the gang. You know, I thought I was unstoppable. I thought, I thought nobody could touch me. That day, I went to the gas station. I just heard a gunshot, boom, and I got shot and I got hit in the ankle. I tried to make it to the car and I was bleeding and I fell. And I slid and I held on to the car. You can see my fingerprints on the car where I fell and it was I slid down, it was all bloody. And when I hit the ground, I heard one of the guys telling the guy with the gun, get him. You know, I was like the trophy. It was like, here he is right here. And it came right, right up to me and shot me. I reached down and shot me in the mouth. That's where I got this car from. And then uh, he took one last step and put the gun to my head and shot it. But that one just scraped my head. It just scraped the top of my head. Ten-year-old Max In this case, it is witnesses that prosecutors say are not cooperating. I was sworn in January 2007. Shortly before, I was sworn in. Uh, a young man named Mac McCrae. Ten-year-old Mac McCrae was shot while asleep Mac inside McRae. his home in March it of 2006. Police, police, police believe gang members were aiming for McCrae's week, older brother, who was a rival gang member. It is witnesses that prosecutors say are not cooperating. How many young people have to die? It just made me sick. No one will be held accountable for this child's death. It upset me. I got angry about it. And I called Pastor Manning and I said, listen, I've had enough of this. I was part of the Van Ness Gangster Blood. It was a way to support 
the habit, and it I quickly had. became a way of life due to my drug. Yeah. Everything stems back to the drugs and alcohol. Once it got so bad that I lost everything I had, and I really, truly became a street person without a home, that's when I realized that I had to do something different. I would have died, but God had a different plan for me. So I worked so hard to get away from that lifestyle that I became disconnected for a while once I started this church. I had finished preaching one Sunday and, and there was a young man on the back row, of the church was full. If you know that you have not been living according to God's will, you ought to come and make the first step. The first step I gave an invitation for anyone that had anything to say. And I saw this hand raised on the very back row and uh, it was a young man, he said, Preacher, I've been listening to everything you had to say. And he walked out in the aisle, he said, I'm a gang member. I'm a gang banger and I'm sick and tired of this. He said, I'm gonna die in these streets. And he reached in his pocket and pulled out his blue flag and he started to weep. And he said, I'm gonna die if I don't change. And that's when I realized I had become disconnected with the streets. And, and that's when God, at that point, God put it in my heart to go back to the streets. We need to start something uh, that we can help young people that's caught up like we used to be. It upset me, I got angry about it. And I called Pastor Manning and I said, listen, I've had enough of this. I said, I wanna to talk to these gang members because I knew that he ministered to felons, former felons, and many who, who most churches wouldn't open their doors to. But in about five days, he called me back. He said, uh, you're not gonna believe this. I've got 21 gang members from 17 different sets that are willing to meet with you. One Saturday afternoon, about five o'clock at his church, and they were all lined up at a table, and we faced them. I went in and sat down. I showed them I didn't have a gun. I didn't have any police officers with me. It wasn't a setup. I wanted to talk. It was a tense situation to say the least, okay? Not just did you have the police, the DA, sitting there across from many people I knew were, were responsible for homicides in our community, but also guys who had been in shootouts just days earlier with each other in, in, in other sets. We got down to it and we talked about it. We talked about the issues. You don't got no centers no more, man. These centers, you know, with basketball, they're not gonna have no hope, Kids man. in the neighborhoods, they look up to them. One of the older gang members said, you can't do anything about this problem. But I said, well, what do you mean? He goes, we caused it. We've got to be the ones to stop it. I said, okay, do it. It's going to take the people that have a desire and that's probably been in those situations before to come together, to work together, to change the mentality. Updates, action items, any other reports? Uh, they can't come out, so I'm using somebody else. And so we went from there and started this organization. For almost three years later, we're, we're actually still working with the older ones now, developing them to do what the mission of TASK is, is teach and save kids. TASK is the name of the uh, outreach ministry, the at-risk youth ministry. It means teaching and saving kids, and that is our focus. What we do, we focus on the older gang members together first, and then we can use the, the same people that used to be out here terrorizing our communities. We can use the same people to mentor our children. I grew up around a neighborhood like that, so it wasn't no, it was a choice, but really wasn't no choice. And once you're in it, it's very, 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 very hard to get out. I'm an older guy, and I got respect in the streets. Even though I'm not on the gang banging stuff no more like that, and everybody know it, you know what I mean? And they listen to us, is what it is, more or less. They listen more to us than they will their parents, because they done glorified what we done done for so long. I mean, a kid that I might not even never met, he'll know my name and know stuff I done done. Uh, they're not going to listen to teachers. They're not going to listen to the police. Uh, they're going to listen to their OG. OG is the original gangster. That's the leader of a particular set. That's who they're going to listen to. So our concept is for the OG, if they're to be involved with us, to work with 
people within their set. The OG has voice, they have influence. It's somebody that, that uh, a young kid will listen to. It's, it's simply about uh, that OG believing and trusting uh, that we can save lives. And using that concept, it's about, it's about people believing that somebody can be rehabilitated and then reintegrate that person back into society. I was on probation. I got certified for a shooting and a robbery. I got shot twice. They had us on murder one charges. I've been to so many funerals. I got a federal case with dealing crack cocaine. And I went to prison. I was like, man. And just sitting in prison thinking about it day after day after day. But the more I sat in there and the more I thought about it, it's like, do you want to wake up every morning to your children? Now what if somebody kill your child? Or what if your child kills someone? Then they'll be sitting in prison with you. So when I came home, I got a job at the Salvation Army. And two months after that, they gave me the keys and made me the manager. And I've been there seven years. I've been home. Yours one, one or two. I, know I own my own home now. My children are doing exceptionally well in school. <laughs> right I, I was a part of the way the community is now. So now I have to get in there and be a part of what I messed up. I have to get in there and rebuild that structure because I'm a part of that. And if I can't help rebuild it, who will? My past was ruthless, you know. It went from, you know, I mean, looking at me wrong, you know, could, it could end up bad for you. And then I met this guy named Andre Jones, and he turned me on to uh, TAS with Pastor Manning, teaching and saving kids. I always helped out youngsters, but sometimes it's been in the wrong way. You see what I'm saying? Leaving them in a negative way. But now it was an opportunity for me to give back and give it to them in a positive way. I was already known as a leader, one of the big... But what I used to be, get back to no the community longer. that we took from. I mean, I thought my life was over. There was no hope for me. And I sat there one day and just, you know, started thinking about all of that and all the things I've done. What I used to be, I'm no longer. Just a memory. You know, I was like the trophy. Stand for what I believe in. I just remember falling to my knees in my cell and just cried out to God. And, you know, I started talking to him and, you know, I just told him I was tired of living the way I was. And now I'm out here and I'm trying to work with these kids, even with adults, you know, trying to do the right thing. I believe that my purpose is to uh, teach and save kids. So I'm looking to stand up and stand for what I believe Get in. Get back to the community that we took Reaching from. Reaching out to the kids. We have to build it up again. And what makes TASC really so effective is that they see a lot, of, a lot of men that they have looked up to for a long time and had credibility in their neighborhoods coming to them and say, listen, there's a better way. That's a powerful message when you have someone who's been there telling you it's not the way to be. Now I'm doing is just trying to give back to something that I, I took to away from reaching out to the kids. Trying to save our children. And giving back. Teaching and saving kids. I'll tell you how effective they are. And this is a, a prime example. One morning I came into work, the phone rang, and this Oklahoma City officer said, David, we're hearing there's gonna be a body count this weekend. What they meant by that was that that they were gonna kill a number of people to send a message. And the way it's supposed to happen is they're gonna go to some clubs where uh, gang members are known to frequent, and they're gonna go in there with, with automatic weapons, semi-automatic rifles, and they're just gonna shoot everyone that's not in their own set. Well, I thought, all right, I called Pastor Manning. Drive-bys generally happen under the cover of night, and the days of the week vary. I ran it down to him very, you know, just very quickly, and he said, may I bring one of the task guys in? They came and sat at my conference table, and I said, here's what I hear is gonna happen this weekend. This gang member and, and Pastor Manning both looked at each other and looked at their watches and they said, well, if it gets dark, by the time it's dark, it's too late. Now what the strength of task is, is its diversity. You've got Bloods and Crips from all different sets in this community. So Pastor Manning can say, we think we're going to have a problem in a certain area 
there will be someone in task that is from that neighborhood and has credibility in that neighborhood. So he sent everyone that was involved in the task program into their respective neighborhoods where they all had credibility and influence. There wasn't a shooting in four weeks. In four, four weekends, we didn't have any gang-related shootings over four weekends. Law enforcement was extremely surprised. Um, now, I knew that why it didn't happen. It was because of those guys. What we found is a lot of the violence on the street now is bleed over violence or called in violence from the prison yards. And if there's a fight on the yard, you'll see those two gangs, those two same gangs, uh, having issues out on the street. In every prison, you will find gangs, including the federal prisons. So we think we're getting rid of the problem, but... You're not. You send them in and they become harder, tougher. They learn how to manipulate and survive even more in prison. So when they come out, they're, they're, they're a lean, mean fighting machine when they get out. DOC pretty much allowed us to go along with the cooperation of Lawton Correctional Facility, which is a private prison. They allowed us to come in and start a pilot program. And for them to let us do something that would normally be a nightmare for a warden, when you think about all these different groups, including uh, the hate groups, sitting at the table with minorities and, and, and all trying to reach a common goal. And I feel good about TAS. I think TAS is the best program I ever put myself or got involved in. If it weren't for y'all, we wouldn't even be at this table. We'd probably be out there fighting each other and everything else. Do I want my kids to go through this? Do I want my kids to do 17 years flat? I'm away from home. This is my family now right here at this table. What I've seen here over the last 18 months is it's made some significant changes because people are talking to each other. Within the facility, uh, those people do have influence and they can make a difference. You know, previously they were creating some of the issues and now uh, by a different viewpoint, they're solving some of the issues. There's some reconvening program where you allow us... I am formerly of the Universal Aryan Brotherhood. TASC is a truly amazing thing. Like, I've never been around people of all these different sets, cliques, whatnot. For other people that attend the meetings that show up and see who these guys are, just seeing that alone and taking that back out onto the yard or when they call home, anything like that, the word gets out there. The thing is, is that when we come together in here, I actually feel like for once, you know, that I'm conscious of something in my life. I really do. Taz is giving me hope. Taz changed my life. A lot of the different gang members, again, many of which were rivals and feud, they are down sitting at the table with each other and discussing issues. It's had a profound effect, I believe, on the violence here in the streets of Oklahoma City and on the violence in that um, prison yard as well. Tass is giving me hope. There is hope for us. Previously, they were creating some of the issues. Teaching and saving kids. In 2005, we had 260 drive-by shootings, which was a, an historic high. And again, when the, when the community engaged, we saw a 48% decrease. We're almost half of that right now. There's been a tipping point. It's not just one thing or two things that's really caused this decrease in gang violence. What it is are many things that have finally come together at a, at a point. I feel like our group has a large part to do with that because we prevent, we try to prevent those situations as soon as we become aware of them. This is uh, the most creative solution I would have ever thought of. Uh, for, for the gang violence problem, and specifically in this community. Really, law enforcement was powerless to stop recruitment of these six, seven, and eight-year-olds. That had to come from these former gang members who had said, this has got to stop. That prevention intervention component through task and other community resources is vital in getting a handle on the gang violence problem. You know, and it's getting all these guys from different gangs and different sides to 
come together. I mean, that's something they've been trying to do for years. I think that's the main focus of TAS right now, is to get them to quit fighting and to start learning from each other and forgiving each other. These youngsters see that. They see all of us gangsters coming together as one because you got Crips, Bloods, you got different Hispanic gangs clicking together as one. We all can't be from gangs. Somebody's gotta be a judge, somebody's gotta be a lawyer, somebody's gotta be a doctor. That's it. It truly is a culture that we're trying to change. And I'm here today, you know, by the grace of God, giving back, you know. And it's here in Oklahoma City that I am doing that. There is hope for us. We really have nothing to lose. We got everything to gain. So I'm looking to stand up and stand for what I believe in. We had to understand that people can change. Just knowing that one life has been changed, it's worth it. I can see that I went through all that so I can help these kids. With money or not, we're going to do what we have to do. I want to give back. You know, it's time for me to I give have to back. I have to get in there and rebuild that structure. This is a way that I see to give back is through TAS. My son is um, having some problems, uh, gang-related problems, uh, and he is now. He was murdered about four months ago. A uh, guy walks up to the car and stick a 9 millimeter in the window on me. And I end up getting certified as a adult at the age of 15. When I was 16, I was in Oklahoma State Prison. This program was made possible by a grant from the Kirkpatrick Foundation. Please call 800-879-6382 or send a check or money order for $2295 to the OETA Foundation, Post Office Box 14190, Oklahoma City 73113.